afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm Barry Rabe, a professor here at the Ford School and the director for the Center of Local, State, and Urban Policy. Uh, we are delighted at Close Up to co-sponsor this event with the School of Public Health, the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy, and we want to acknowledge in particular support that we received from the Gil Oman and Martha Darling Health Policy Fund. Delighted to have Martha with us here uh, today to pursue this, this event. Um, Federalism has been called many things. Mm. I'm not sure I've ever seen the title fractious before, but it certainly fits this case well now and historically. I must confess that there was a time a couple of decades ago where I was working on a doctoral dis dissertation trying to come to terms with federalism. A little tiny slice of that involved Medicaid. Mm. And not understanding what Medicaid was, why it was mm. created, or how it worked. Did not understand it, and I went into what is then and now one of the world's great bookstores, a seminary co-op bookstore at the University of Chicago, and found this book, <laughs> the Policy and the Bureaucracy. Blood red, notice. It was, it was all in bright red, but you can see the spine has been faded from uh, sun exposure. <laughs> Chapter 7, Medicaid, a Commercial Market Strategy for the Poor by Frank Thompson. It really opened up for me an understanding of how Medicaid came into being and how it worked. And here we are a few decades later with the book-length version <laughs> yeah. with all kinds of new content called Medicaid Politics, Federalism, P Policy Durability, and Health Reform, just released uh, late last year by Georgetown University Press by Frank Thompson. Uh, Frank, as many of you know, is one of our nation's leading scholars in the area of health politics and policy. It's a real privilege to invite him here to the Ford School. Uh, he has served on the faculties of the University of Georgia and the State University of New York at Albany, where he's held a series of administrative posts. Frank is a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration and now is a member of the faculty at Georgetown. And so we're very pleased to have him here to talk about his book, but also put it into the immediate context whereby Medicaid has gained even new saliency and moving in directions that some of us probably could not have anticipated just a few years ago. We're also delighted to be joined mm -hmm. by Scott Greer, a colleague from the School of Public Health, the Department of Health and Management and Policy. Uh, Scott works in a number of areas directly relevant to this and has also thought about issues of centralization and decentralization of health politics and policy in federated and multi-level systems, including the European Union. Uh, Scott was a visiting scholar with us in close up during the, the fall term, and it's, it's great to have you, you here with us today. Um, with that, we're going to ask Frank to provide extended remarks on his views on fractious federalism and the future of Medicaid, turn things over to Scott for some reaction and reflection, and then, as you can see, uh, the table will allow for us to have some Q&A, and hopefully we'll open this up for, for, for extended conversation. Uh, but, but before going any further, please do extend a warm welcome to Frank Thompson as we welcome him to our campus. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Very kind. Let's see. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Barry, for those uh, uh, very kind introductory remarks. And let me say how much of a pleasure it is to be at the Ford School. I was uh, telling the students uh, I met with at noon that if we looked at the top 20 research campuses in the country, I've been in every one had been in every one except for some strange reason Ann Arbor. So it's been a great, great privilege and treat to come and uh, get acquainted with the campus. I would also note that I had the great good fortune probably, oh gosh, 25 years ago uh, to, to when uh, Gerald Ford visited uh, the University of Georgia and I was head of the Department of Political Science to actually sit next to him and moderate a session where he responded, uh, made remarks and responded to a lot of questions. And I've had very great uh, respect for him and I'm very pleased to be here. Okay, let's get the show on the road. And Barry, because I know we want, I've got too many PowerPoints, I'm targeting to end about 10 to 2. Does that sound, sound sensible? And we'll give uh, Scott a chance uh, here. All right. So I wanted to open, I know there's a lot of stuff to read in this thing, but I wanted to open with, with two themes. 
And the top theme is from one of the founders, James Madison, which is all about uh, fractious federalism. Madison did not envision among the founders that political parties would come to play as great a role in uh, the, the political system as they've come to play. But I do like the line about the potential to, res to resist and frustrate the measures of each other. They understood that they were building in tensions in this federal system from the, uh, from the get-go. The second quote is from Aaron Woldovsky. Uh, 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 Aaron Woldovsky founded one of the first schools of public policy at the University of California, Berkeley. He's a foremost authority in the budget process, uh, a major political scientist. But some, what is it, 25 years ago, uh, he offered an observation about public service where you have a contentious environment, where people, that the key sides of the political spectrum do not ag agree, and the challenges that poses for people committed to public service and bureaucracies. And as I've interviewed and talked to people who are trying to implement the uh, Affordable Care Act in a context where uh, there is at least where where uh, there's at least one party hoping that they will fail miserably at it. I thought that sort of captured uh, a sense I have of uh, public service being one of the hardest, uh, uh, the highest service because it's the hardest service. All right, so. It's about Medicaid. A lot of you are familiar with it. So you've read the initial chapters of my book, but just as sort of reminder, Harry Truman, ins or I'm sorry, Lyndon Johnson goes off, signs Medicaid, Medicare uh, legislation into Harry Truman's home in Independence, uh, uh, Missouri, um, and, and it gets going in 1965, a fiscal entitlement to the states. Big enrollments, over $400 billion federal and state monies uh, spent each year on, on Medicaid. A lot of it, majority of it, going to long-term care. This is uh, ensures uh, most people on Medicaid are getting sort of basic health care services, but the money is in uh, substantially in long-term care. Okay, so a bit of uh, a bit on the the book and, uh, and its sort of core theme. The first part of my talk today sort of draws from the book and in, in a sort of once over lightly sense gets at some of the core themes. The second part I want to consider where we are now with some of the developments that are really happening after I uh, uh, finish the book and, uh, and we'll speculate a little bit on where Medicaid may be uh, heading. But in any event, the book focuses as those of you in Barry's class knows, on the period from Clinton uh, and then into the uh, Obama years. And I make a number of uh, justifications for why I think this is an especially fruitful period to study Medicaid. But the biggest single reason that I think it's fruitful is that it was during this period and it was Clinton-led, um, there was a major movement through waivers and other means to devolve authority to the states over the Medicaid program. Uh, the Clinton administration was a clear watershed uh, in this regard, and I think it, it makes for an interesting sort of period uh, to follow. Uh, I then deal with um, uh, this sort of paradox. There are a lot of pessimists about uh, Medicaid. There are all sorts of reasons why people think Medicaid wasn't going to have much staying power or would constantly erode over time. There's a classic line, a program for the poor is a poor program, by which they mean it's not only poor, it helps the poor, but it just doesn't have any political muscle associated with it. There's a whole, uh, among economists, uh, a, a theory called the Leviathan theory, which argues that uh, you know states in their quest for economic development will gradually uh, 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 erode benefits, redistributed benefits for poor, lower income people. For the uh, and and there's a welfare magnet version of that, and it's sort of uh, in oversimplified form. There's this kind of race to the bottom notion whenever you turn. Uh, uh, programs for the poor over to uh, the states. There is recent evidence that declining trust in government, which has been, as you know, quite marked since uh, the 1960s, also has particularly negative implications for redistributed programs, those that take from people who got money and, and uh, shift to low-income uh, 
income folks. So there was a lot of reasons in the literature to be pessimistic, that Medicaid would have much staying power, that it wouldn't just show a steady pattern of erosion over time. And indeed, what I argue in the book is that there's a side of Medicaid in this period I was examining it that eroded appreciably, and that is uh, Medicaid is a service entitlement. Now, Medicaid, as you, uh, I think most of you know, is, a, is an entitlement in a twofold sense. One, it's a fiscal entitlement to the states. If Michigan spends X dollars on its Medicaid program, the federal government is required at a certain match rate to give Michigan uh, uh, the money. It's not, they can't cap it, it's fiscal entitlement. But the second sense in which Medicaid was historically an entitlement was as a service in, in entitlement. That is, once a state, subject to a certain federal regulation, said that certain people were eligible for some set of benefits, um, people all over the state had to, were qualified to get those benefits, and you couldn't do, you couldn't cap them. You couldn't say, well, we're running out of money in the state, so now we're going to set up a wait list, and, and when time comes, we'll give you these benefits. Once you were deemed eligible for Medicaid, it meant that the state was supposed to provide that service, even if it was putting a lot of uh, immediate fiscal uh, stress in the states. Any event, the argument in the book, uh, sort of once over lightly here, is that in this period from 92 through to the present, really, or really 2010, I guess, that there was a steady erosion in this sense of Medicaid as a legal entitlement to you. And a number of things uh, uh, were at work there. But principally, it was waivers. And under waivers, uh, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, uh, states increasingly won the uh, right to do certain Medicaid benefits in particular parts of the state, say managed care, but not in others. So the Medicare, the Medicaid benefits in a state might vary appreciably by where you live, which county you were in, in Michigan or whatever, whatever uh, state you would, uh, uh, you'd want. So, so there was a paring down of this statewide requirement through um, long-term care waivers designed to create home and community-based, uh, more options for home and community-based services, states also won the ability to establish wait lists for especially in the area of, of long-term care. So if, if there's an intellectually disabled individual who at uh, the age of 18 wants to transition into a group home uh, with, uh, and, and receive um, uh, home community-based services in that, in that home, there's often a significant wait list. Depends on the state. Medicaid is all about state variation, as you know. But wait lists became much more prominent uh, than they had been before. Another development to weaken Medicaid is this uh, service entitlement was uh, a set of, of, of statutory decisions, uh, the repeal of something called the Boren Amendment in uh, 1997, which had given providers of services access to federal courts to complain that, that states weren't living up to their obligations under the, uh, under the Medicaid law. And uh, as a result of the repeal of that amendment, and then a set of court de decisions that I won't belabor uh, with you here, uh, the, the ability of providers or Medicaid enrollees to go to federal courts to enforce their uh, Medicaid rights increasingly uh, diminished. So the story, so there was a lot of, uh, to recapitulate, pessimism about Medicaid staying power. And if you just look at the sort of legal service entitlement aspect of it, uh, it's a case of erosion. But, and this is sort of the storyline of the book, that if you look elsewhere about Medicaid, it's, it's a story of growth. It's a story of expansion. Um, in the book, I, tra I show how in all 50 states, even the most conservative, Medicaid expenditures and enrollees per person in poverty steadily increased over this period from 1992 
uh, into 2010. And then finally, we had, and this I had no idea was going to happen when I started writing this book, but uh, sometimes you get lucky. Um, it, it, finally, we had the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, a plast in 2010. And lo and behold, of the 30 plus million people that were slated to gain coverage over under Obamacare, he now endorses that term, um, half of them were to gain through a Medicaid expansion. And the, the specifics of, of, of the Affordable Care Act are that if you, that any individual under a 133% of poverty, but with some uh, uh, with some manipulation on uh, how they count income, it goes up to 138%. Anyone under that uh, uh, income level would be then eligible uh, for Medicaid, and that was Medicaid then was to be the floor of a national. It's not quite, there, there are gaps in the coverage, but of a substantial expansion in the uh, in, uh, insurance coverage in the, uh, in the United States. Uh, so there was this huge, in terms of enrollment, spending, uh, Medicaid uh, increasingly took off. I look at other markers in the book, too. I don't rely purely on these numbers. And I argue that, for instance, Medicaid made a lot of progress in being smarter about long-term care. It used to put everyone in institutions, nursing homes. And increasingly, in the Clinton period, we grew uh, uh, the, the amount of long-term care provided in a home and community rather than in a nursing home or another large institution, grew from about 15 to 45 percent. I think, although the evidence is somewhat mixed, uh, that, that the movement of Medicaid enrollees to manage care was on the whole a good thing. And there were other uh, signs and evidence that Medicaid, for all its problems, I'm not portraying this as uh, the kind of insurance program you all want to get on. But it, 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 for all its problems, it was yielding positive uh, outcomes in terms of access and in terms of, uh, of health outcomes. OK, and I mentioned a couple other things there. Let me move on here. And so, um, so the case is then Medicaid sort of confounded some pessimists and was remarkably durable and sort of a growth story. And so what's going on? Why would this, uh, why would this pattern unfold? And um, the top line on this chart just refers to that sort of the constraining model of federalism, you know, the welfare magnet. States are not good sorry, to, to, to assign redistributive programs to. But there's an alternative sort of perspective that the federal system, my, my colleague Dick Nathan is a big proponent of, of a former colleague Dick Nathan is a big proponent of this, but others too, that the dynamics of federalism, rather than leading to the contraction of the welfare state, in a certain sense, lead to its expansion. And there's some work out of Europe, uh, uh, too, uh, to, this, to this effect. So this notion is that federalism can be catalytic. It would fit more uh, easily with the sort of uh, growth uh, and what I argue is enhanced durability during this, this period. But the literature of, of sort of catalytic federalism is, in, in my view, sort of underspecified. What are the more precise dynamics that are interacting to drive, in this case, uh, Medicaid uh, growth? And so you'll see listed there on the uh, PowerPoint what hit me as, and, and I, they weren't unique to me, by the way, uh, it, it, some of them. Others, I think I played up a uh, good bit more than had been done in the literature. But it's sort of a list. So, there's no question the Medicaid funding source is a, or I'm sorry, the Medicaid formula is a fiscal stimulus. If Michigan is considering expanding its Medicaid program, it knows it will only, you know, it'll pay, I guess now people were telling, I forget, Medicaid matches a little above 50% in the state of Michigan. So at a minimum, it knows for every dollar it invests in Michigan, it leverages a federal dollar. In the case of the Affordable Care Act, federal policymakers even if they might have, in a dream world, preferred another kind of uh, health insurance expansion, they knew they could leverage a certain amount of state effort and preserve a certain amount of state effort by working through this. So the funding formula is huge in this uh, uh, equation. The second point toward uh, positive social construction 
Medicaid increasingly, I argue, it partly because of the wealth, it became delinked from the notion that they were all a bunch of uh, poor women, uh, you know, welfare uh, uh, folks. Uh, that it moved forward. Also, uh, uh, Medicaid increasingly in long-term care became a, a program for the middle class. Uh, and so a much more positive social construction than you get oftentimes for programs that serve the poor. I know we've had a lot of talk about takers in the last campaign, but still, uh, I think Medicaid is, uh, is, uh, is, is, it, it came over time to be viewed more positively. Um, I won't go into the supporters, providers, and advocates. Obviously, the whole set, I mean, for nursing homes, Medicaid is huge. Hospitals, it's huge. Uh, there's a whole community, and there's ag advocacy groups out there, especially for people with disabilities, that fervently support uh, uh, Medicaid. We had uh, part of the Affordable Care Act expansion is a, just this fleeting period when the Democrats ran thing. That's what the fourth <laughs> bullet did. I think many of you know the last time the Democrats had a, had a Democratic president and a, essentially a filibuster-proof majority in, in the Senate was under Jimmy Carter, the first term, 1977-78. Uh, and at that point, there were a lot more conservatives in the Democratic Party. Now we've had, of course, this sort of polarization and an ideological sorting. So it's very rare. Um, but let me, uh, yeah, I think I've got the time. Just pick up on, a, on the last two items on this list that I think created sort of uh, catalytic uh, forces for growth because I think I've, my work does more to develop them than, than, than heretofore in the Medicaid literature in any event. So uh, let me turn the page. The intergovernmental lobby, governors uh, to the fore, and the reference to Sam Beer there is simply uh, uh, to a Harvard professor, great student of federalism, Barry Rabe knows him well, um, um, uh, who in, in 1978 wrote a, an, an article in the Political Science Review, and there was a lot of concern that with all the great society programs of Lyndon Johnson, the federal government was just becoming so powerful and the states were this puny force that uh, was not able to influence things much. And Sam Beer said, there's too much anxiety about this, that states are still have a lot of clout within our federal system. And one reason is uh, federal government relies on them to implement things. Yeah, there's a huge amount of uh, influence that can be exerted if you're the implementing agent of a federal program. And then the second thing he pointed out, which is really what this slide is about, is the role of the what he called the intergovernmental lobby, and I focus on governors uh, to, to a great uh, a degree. And the, in the book, I uh, argue that uh, well, governors are, and, and what the governors want, and partisan factions of the governors uh, want, is certainly not determinative, determinative in terms of what happens uh, to Medicaid policy, but that there is a strong preference on the part of federal policymakers, members of Congress or a president, when they uh, want to do things to Medicaid, to at least have significant support, especially among members of their own political party, governors of their own political party, at the state level uh, when they do things. Governors, uh, 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 if you think of them, and I'm not going to go into it in the interest of time, but they have, when they speak, they're not just any interest group. They have a, a good bit of legitimacy. They command a lot of media uh, attention. And uh, for federal policymakers to ram a, a federal change in Medicaid statute uh, through with great opposition from governors, especially those of their own party, is not something that federal policymakers consider lightly. So. Um, this relates to what I'm going to talk about in a, a few minutes. So I want to, if you look at the PowerPoint, it talks about gu gubernatorial preferences during ordinary political times. And uh, uh, in general, governors prefer, they like all the money Medicaid gives them. Uh, and they prefer the more money, uh, the, the second point, the more money the better. If they can get an even mat better match rate, that's terrific. And then they want, they don't want any strings attached to the money. Uh, they'd love to be able to spend it most anyway, and I'm not impugning them. They, they, for good reason, they think they know how to spend it better than the federal government often does. So during ordinary political times, 
this is the way uh, uh, governors uh, tend to behave. And I argue in the book, the book, uh, as those of you in the class know, goes into some length about the failed efforts of uh, Newt Gingrich, who was driven by a set of Republican governors to get Medicaid converted to a block grant in the, in the 1990s. And this was led by, it was led by John Engler. He's a major uh, figure uh, in the book, as well as Tommy, uh, 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 Tommy Thompson. But I argue that in the period after that failed, that the, the gubernatorial preferences turned kind of ordinary in the sense that I'm using the, the phrase here. And then increasingly Clinton, and remember this devolve more and more, give them waivers kind of approach Clinton have. It was kind of, uh, uh, to use a, a phrase that's much in the news these days, a certain kind of grand bargain. Governors, I'm going to give you all sorts of waivers. You're going to be able to shape it more the way you want. And increasingly, governors, including Republicans, lost much incentive to go after a block grant because if they could get Medicaid as a fiscal entitlement and still have a lot of flexibility, why bother to spend all your time then you know, working on a block grant, which almost always means uh, less uh, money? So I argue then that in that period afterwards, uh, there was a, um, a sort of uh, spirit of acceptance of Medicaid. And if you look at the major Medicaid expansions, whether it's Weld and Romney in, uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts, uh, Christy Todd Whitman in New Jersey, Governor Pataki in uh, New York, a lot of them were the, you know, these expansions under waivers were led by Republican governors. The final bullet is in these, is just, and I'll come back to it, whether in these intensely partisan times, whether governors will behave more now as members of a grand Republican governors in particular, is a grand party coalition. I'm a faithful member of the party and we don't like Obamacare, or whether the sort of pragmatism that I found in Republican governors during these ordinary political times uh, will reassert itself. Okay, so um, let me see how I'm doing on time. Let me move on here. Um, let me go to... Um, the waiver part of it. You remember there were sort of six variables that I looked at. And I think my analysis of, of waivers is that it was a major sort of fuel for the Medicaid expansion, partly for the reasons I've alluded to earlier, but there are two basic kinds of waivers as the first two items on this slide indicate. There were the 19, uh, section 19, yeah, Medicaid is a section uh, uh, 19 of the Social Security Act. And these waivers passed and authorized in 1981 were designed to move people from institutions into home and community-based uh, services. Uh, there are about 300 of these waivers operate, if states operate home and community-based service under these waivers, about 300 of them out there now. Two-thirds of all money that Medicaid spends on home and community-based services is done under, under uh, uh, waivers. So it, it, it enticed states, for reasons I won't get into here, my argument is, to do a lot more home and community-based service uh, 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 delivery than would have ever occurred if they had to stick within the boilerplate of the Medicaid statute. Um, the other kind of waiver, which are the real big enchilada waivers, are, are the demonstration waivers, which were approved, uh, Section 1115 uh, Social Security Act was around in 19, it was approved in 1962 before Medicaid's birth. But the bottom line here is that for the first, uh, what, 25 years of the Medicaid, program, the federal government was very reluctant to grant these major demonstration waivers. Some of the Bruce Vladek, a former uh, uh, official who ran the what was then Healthcare Financing Administration, estimates there were about 50. Clinton came in and says to the states, 
come one, come all, I'm re you know, he had stipulations. It wasn't any old thing. But he, he got behind giving states much more discretion, making it much easier uh, to get these uh, kinds of waivers. And as a result, we had some of the, a lot of innovation by the states, those Republican governors I mentioned. And of course, then we had uh, the, the, the big bang of uh, states as laboratories of democracy. Romney Care in Massachusetts which was a product of negotiation. The Bush administration did not want to renew a demonstration waiver that, that Massachusetts had since the mid-90s uh, to do managed care and expand enrollments. And in the wake of that negotiation, Mitt Romney, uh, working with Ted Kennedy, came up with this template for uh, virtually almost universal health care in Massachusetts. And then that became, of course, the foundation uh, for Obamacare. Uh, subsequently. And the uh, last couple of points, I'm, I'm not going to go into them now, but the argument of the book, uh, in the interest of time, but the argument of the book is that this uh, uh, waiver, willingness to use waivers, facilitated a kind of policy learning. It facilitated this grand bargain between the governors and the federal government uh, that I mentioned a little while ago and was a source of uh, uh, growth and expansion in the program. Now, however, uh, we turn to the sort of looking forward part of the talk. And um, so we had this, in this period I studied it, uh, I argue a pretty stunning uh, move forward by Medicaid. And, 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 and so now I turn to the issue of will this have staying power in the, in the, in the current uh, era. And of course, in the case of Medicaid, as you all know, is in the wake of the 2012 Supreme Court decision, the Medicaid expansion essentially became an option for the states rather than mandated. Um, and um, so there are uh, 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 a, a range of issues present now that weren't present in the past. Uh, we have enormous federal debt. States, for a whole range of reasons, are in some of the most precarious financial uh, circumstances that they've been uh, uh, easily over the last 20, uh, 30, uh, 30 years. And, um, and so just looking at the debt issue alone, we have this issue of well, how, how, what is the federal government going to do to cope with the debt? And I look at a couple of uh, what I call bipartisan approaches. And Bull Simpson, in, in terms of how they would treat Medicaid, Bull Simpson leaves Medicaid alone pretty much. It's about a $60 billion savings over a 10-year period. But another bipartisan, good faith bipartisan proposal, Domenici Rivlin, really does alter Medicaid a good book. And I, I think would alter some of the dynamics that fueled uh, Medicaid's uh, enhanced durability. And then we come to uh, a, par a partisan approach, I argue, in this, in this period. Uh, and that is uh, uh, the Republican initiative to retrench Medicaid. In the book, I talk about how after Gingrich failed to get the block grant going and, you know, follow John Engler's lead, or, you know, or to see John Engler and, and Tommy Thompson, that the Republican governors pulled back from any desire to see Medicaid block granted, to taken away as a fiscal entitlement. And, in 19, and so in 2003, when President Bush came up with his own version of a block grant proposal, uh, the Republican governor, governors, uh, very difficult to find anyone who wanted to support it. Moreover, there was this sort of bazaar, almost Orwellian uh, congressional appearance by Tommy Thompson, who was then Secretary of Health and Human Services, in which he uh, denied that, that the proposal was a block grant at all. And it led to this, if you like reading congressional testimony, it, it, it led to this this is not a block grant, says Thompson. And Henry Waxman says, yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. This goes on for about a page, denying that you know, you'd even want to mention the phrase block grant. I mean, how ugly and politically unappealing. Uh, well, uh, let me just say that that changed when uh, the Tea Party had a big victory in 2010. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, Representative Ryan's proposal, obviously, for uh, Medicaid is uh, would not only convert it to a block grant, but would carve $800 billion out of the program over a 10-year period. Compare, say, to 
uh, Simpson Bowles 58 or even the Dominici Rivlin um, uh, 100 uh, 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 two hundred billion dollars in a in a in a in a ten year uh, in a ten year period. So what? And, and of course, Romney and Ryan ran on this. And and I guess what is interesting to me and other colleagues like my friend Colleen Grogan at, at uh, Chicago, who's been saying it's getting risky for politicians to attack Medicaid in these times, that at least among the leadership of the Republican Party, they don't think it's very risky to attack, uh, attack Medicaid. How, if they ever got close to doing this block grant, the Republican governors would respond, whether as pragmatists, because this would be devastating fiscally for them, or whether they would be loyal members of a partisan coalition, I think is a very uh, interesting question. Okay, so by my reckoning, I've got five minutes here, and let me see how, what I'm going to pick to do. Um, let me just, I, I want to focus on this just very, very briefly, um, and I, I realize that Mitt Romney did not win the presidency, but what Mitt Romney's quotes here, and then the Republican Party platform's endorsement indicates that presidents, and I would argue Clinton with waivers, have, without gaining congressional approval for action, enormous discretion to shape the context of a policy and to see whether it succeeds or fails. I doubt legally whether Romney could have done what he said he did, you know, he promised to do, uh, if, if he'd have won the election. But could he have severely impeded, assuming he couldn't get it repealed in Congress, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act? Uh, absolutely. I made an argument elsewhere that I won't go into, into today. So I'm sort of highlighting then, uh, and this is my particular research interest for the moment, I'm going to very briefly barrel on. Um, uh, so one of the things I'm looking at now that wasn't in the book and I still haven't researched adequately is the Obama administration's strategies for dealing with the implementation of Medicaid and now uh, uh, needing to coax the states to do it voluntarily. Originally it was you've got to do this if you want to keep your Medicaid program. Now the Obama administration confronts a, a circumstance where um, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it has to think it's Medicaid strategy. And I'm not going to go into the, uh, the first, these are things I'm writing about, but I'm going to leave them aside. I'm going to go to the strategies in the wake of the Supreme Court ruling in, in June 2012. And essentially what the Obama administration has done, you know, a lot of states especially those that didn't like it so much, said, oh, now that the court has ruled, uh, you'll let us do half the expansion. We won't have to do the whole thing. We'll do partial expansion. The Obama administration has just ruled that out. It's all or nothing. You've got to do the whole 138% of poverty or forget about it. Um, and, but, the, but I will point to one additional strategy here before I move on, since I've talked a lot about waivers. In the last couple of weeks, as a possible leverage point on, on the waiver front, uh, the, the state of Oklahoma, Governor Mary Fallon announced, we don't want any part of this Obamacare. She's actually very pragmatic, reasonable in a lot of senses, but she's under a lot of pressure. But she said, we do want to renew a waiver that has covered a certain group of people up to 200% of poverty. And the initial response of the Obama administration is, we don't see a reason to extend this waiver. If you want to cover these people, sign on to the Medicaid expansion. And I was listening to Scott Walker. I didn't listen, but I read the clip on Scott Walker in Wisconsin or Mike Pence down in, uh, Governor Pence down in Indiana. They all seem to be saying, oh, we don't want to do this Medicaid expansion, but we do want to continue these nice waivers we have. The degree to which, one of the things I'm going to be watching is the degree to which the Obama administration plays hardball on waiver renewals in an effort to sort of put the screws on governors to opt for it. I don't know the degree they'll do it, but the Oklahoma case intrigued me. All right, uh, racing on. I'm down to about my last two minutes here. Um, uh, so I, uh, this, I think there's a case that over time most states will participate in the Medicaid expansion. And if you look at the early Medicaid program, it took a while for states to sign on. That is in 1965. But I do think 
uh, as I mentioned before, that partisan polarization, uh, to the degree we remain as polarized, and Obamacare is seen as the, uh, as the end of freedom in the United States in, in certain Tea Party circles, and in certain states, it may make it harder it, it may be the buy-in we saw after 1965 won't be as great. And this is, uh, am I on the right slide? Yeah, right, right. This is the grand finale, so to speak. Uh, so the early returns on state participation in the, uh, uh, in the Medicaid program, um, uh, you know, obviously you say, well, the Democrats, it's sort of assumed, will eventually sign on in this in this period. There have been, by my count, at least among the governors, six Republican governors who signed on for the Medicaid expansion. Uh, there was a group of governors out west, uh, Nevada, uh, uh, New Mexico, and then uh, Governor Jan Brewer in Arizona who signed on, and the sort of working assumption is that they're looking at Latinos as a demographic, and Latinos want this. There's North Dakota that signed on. And then uh, 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 your, your very own Governor, uh, 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 Governor Snyder has signed on, and John Kasich uh, of Ohio has signed on. So there is some movement. What Chris Christie will do in New Jersey is still the great mystery. We're all waiting, and, uh, and we'll have to see. But let me just conclude then. Uh, uh, with a comment, but the last item on this slide, that one of the, you know, one of the big issues in, in terms of whether we achieve national goals with the, uh, this Medicaid expansion is what large, popular, 10 most populous states do. And in that regard, Florida, Georgia, and Texas may be critical to whether the ACA's uh, enrollment goals are met because these, and they've all rejected at least to this point, the Medicaid expansion, and uh, they are home to over 20% of the people in this country who lack health insurance and would be eligible for Medicaid coverage. So that's it. Thank you. So you want me to I didn't clear that thing for you. I'm sorry. I just need a clock so I don't rabbit on. So first I want to second what Barry said and what I'm sure you've already concluded, which is that this is a wonderful book. And one of the reasons that it's a wonderful book is that it's based on knowing a lot about policy, which necessarily involves understanding politics, but also knowing what the politics are about, because ultimately this is about the disposition of a whole lot of money, a whole lot of interests, a whole lot of waste, which is also known as a revenue stream for many people and a whole lot of people's lives. And the reason that matters is that we're having a temporary inconvenience in political science, which is presently the study of the Democratic Party. It paints a traditional picture of American politics as negotiated with weak parties, lots of transactional behavior, side payments, pork barrel, and so forth. As a Europeanist, I quite prefer the political system we appear to be living in now, at least among the Republicans, where you find out what the party leadership says, and then you recognize that the legislators will meekly march to do what they're told. And I say that because most of what I'm going to say is political science in the sense of the study of Democratic Party politics. And I want to highlight something that Frank mentioned, which is just what a series of near misses the entire Medicaid program and the Affordable Care Act has recently experienced. Mm. If the election had gone differently, we could be looking at vast, vast changes in every aspect of health policy passed as the Ryan budget under reconciliation. And, well, we'd have a lot to do. <laughs> so, sorry, I changed the order of the things I'm talking about. What I want to focus on primarily is what this teaches us, not just about Medicaid, but about federalism. And federalism, as Frank said, gets blamed for a lot, right? It gets blamed for a race to the bottom, that if you entrust some sort of a tax to the state or some kind of a regulatory authority to the state, mm. they will rapidly compete it away. It used to be that if you wanted to charter a corporation, you had to have a public purpose. Delaware said, hell, you don't need a public purpose. And that's why practically every place that you, every company that you know of is mm -hmm. headquartered in Delaware formally. Likewise, we used to, many states still do, regulate credit cards and how they can behave towards you. South Dakota decided that they didn't need to regulate credit cards, and the result is that you send all of your credit card statement bills, 
of payments to South Dakota. They get blamed for inequality. Well, that's by definition. If you're going to have a federal country, you are accepting the proposition that a sick baby will have different life chances based on where its parents live. Okay? Deal with it. Hmm. You have another option. It's called France. <laughs> and, of course, it brings complexity. I mean, just try to explain the Affordable Care Act to somebody who isn't, a, at least to some extent, a junkie for American politics, American public administration, and American health policy. And look at the simplifications even among very savvy people. We talk about implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Oh, that's how it looks from Washington, right? They got their legislation passed, now they're going to implement it. Well, from the point of view of Lansing, this isn't implementation. This is actual legislation. This is one of the bigger and more consequential things that the legislature in the state of Michigan has had to argue about. And I don't think they saw it as their role to meekly put through whatever emerged from Washington. So complexity, inequality, and potentially a race to the bottom, these are all fairly heavy charges to levy against federalism. But you could argue in response that in no sense is it the problem. And this is where I become contentious, I think. Because across the board, if you want to look at the structure of American public policy, it's not so much in the states frustrating each other as it is in the way that our fragmented executive system, our relationship between the executive two houses of a really fractious legislature and the courts, managed to check and balance each other. That old mm -hmm. thing you hear in high school politics still works extraordinarily well. And you see this in most polities. Subnational governments, which we politely call them in order to disguise all the different variations between Polish voivodeships mm -hmm. and the Flemish community and American states, generally exercise the autonomy that they have within the framework set by the larger government, by the federal government in the United States. They exercise it within their capacities as a lobby. The National Governors Association is a lobby. Washington has many lobbies. After financial services, health is the largest source and employer of lobbyists. And there's wonderful stuff about, in the book about the reverse lobbying to which the governors were subjected. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a lobby with enough clout to get attention, such as the AARP or the NGA, you're also a lobby with enough clout that people who want to influence your decisions are going to intervene seriously in trying to modify what you do. And there's wonderful and highly instructive stories about that. Quebec, incidentally, considered joining the National Governors Association. Yes. And because somehow they think that the United States would be more friendly to a small <laughs> francophone society. <laughs> and they pretty That's rapidly ended stuff. the experiment yeah. when they realized this is a lobby. You know, we might as well hire a Burstyn Marstall or a Weber Shandwick to represent us because in Canada, Quebec swaggers in and they have practically diplomatic relations. Mm. Join the NGA, different thing. Mm. So here we have Medicaid as basically a nice example, right? The states vary within what the law says. The states vary within what intergovernmental relations says. As was pointed out, Massachusetts' behavior has in large part been triggered and shaped by the structure of Medicaid and Medicaid waivers. It's not just that a bunch of Democrats and Mitt Romney decided that they were going to restructure the health care system. And this, what matters is flexibility, money, legislation. And that also brings to bear a rule of politics, which is nobody actually cares about federalism. People care about yeah. politics. Notably, this is why states' rights is a technical term for racism. The only exceptions are the Quebecs of the world, of which there are none in the United States, where their political agenda is precisely their own autonomy. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? That means that it's actually, Medicaid is pretty rational. It doesn't look rational, but it is. Because fiscal federalism one-on-one -on -one says that you want to do two things at the largest possible level. Set basic citizenship rights and pool risks. It says you don't want to administer and make little decisions at the largest possible level because Washington is a very, very long way away from Ishpening and Escanaba. Hmm. So is Lansing, but that's a different question. <laughs> so from that point, and that's what federations are. When you actually compare them, federations are pretty good about moving the money around at the biggest level and having delivery and policy experimentation and implementation at a much, much lower level. Now, that points to executive federalism, which in the context of the very polarized American politics with the extraordinary level of party discipline that I mentioned, 
might not be such a bad thing. Because think of the Canadians. <laughs> Canadian poli party politics are obscenely complicated. I don't recommend studying it unless you like real head scratchers. <laughs> But Canadian voters, it turns out, have a much simpler problem than American voters if they don't like something. They have to apportion blame between Ottawa and their provincial premier. That's a much simpler yeah, problem than figuring cool. out it's why we don't have the public option or why we don't have Medicaid block grants in the United mm -hmm. States. And it's messy. Well, so what? Are you going to redesign your constitution because it's ugly? Polit it'll rapidly become encrusted and barnacled with all sorts of other fixes. Mm -hmm. If you get the basics right, if the money is being distributed on a level that prevents the thing being essentially a bad insurance scheme, and you deliver the policy on a level where people have a chance to experiment, where failure is confined, where disappointment is limited to a single place, mm -hmm. then you've actually done a pretty good job and you've done what pretty much all the other decentralized countries in the world mm -hmm. come up with. It's frankly infantile to say you want to throw that all aside and, you know, decentralize insurance regulation uh, to the states in the theory that we'll have some nice clean market because rapidly again it'll become complex. So one of the things that the Scottish government of all people like to say, and I've never seen an academic patent put on this but it's beautiful and I'll leave you with it, is that in making policy there's a trilemma. A trilemma is where there's three choices and you can have two, right? Good, cheap, and quick. Choose two. Well, the federal, the policy trilemma is agreed everywhere and now. You can have your policy agreed and now in some places. Texas doesn't agree. Mm -hmm. You can have a policy that's agreed everywhere and that's Germany and that's why their policies take 30 years to pass. <laughs> and you can have a policy that's everywhere and now and come practically to the brink of a civil war. Mm -hmm. And you might argue that the structure of American federalism and the structure of Medicaid is not just rational in the sense of getting the money and the laws in the right place, despite the ugliness, despite the fact that none of you ever want to be on Medicaid, but also because it's a pretty good reflection of the ultimate decision that even if we tried to order a pizza, we couldn't achieve simultaneously everywhere agreed and now mm -hmm. in this room. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to be here. You want to stay up? Yep. Thanks to you both. You know, I hadn't realized we were going to be talking about Quebec, Scott, but <laughs> that's a great I thought that seven years ago, the state of California launched a nationwide effort to create a coalition of other jurisdictions that would join it in carbon cap and trade. That process has begun, and the only other partner that California has is Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> so federalism indeed makes for that's strange right. bad sure. fellows. We, we wanted to allow for both presentation and opportunity for a serious conversation, question and answer. Uh, if you would like to, to take questions from the floor, when you are recognized, if you just pause, Bonnie will bring a microphone if you'd identify yourself and then ask your question and we'll, we'll get going. Who'd like to begin the conversation? Please. Hi, I'm David Alvin, I'm an assistant professor here, and I have a lot of opinions on this topic. Because I, I study uh, geographic differences in, in federal taxation, spending. I'm also half French and half Southerner, so I have a very complex relationship with federalism, uh, both centrist and, and decentralist. And I've lived in both Quebec and in California, so hmm. I'm all over the map. <laughs> uh, so one thing I, I think that was really interesting, and I've, I've talked to people about waivers. I'm still trying to understand what, how waivers work. But one thing I do understand is that the matching rates in America are, are very unequal, right. depending on the state. So in California and New York, the, the federal government matches one for one for every dollar the state spends. In Michigan, we get two dollars for every mm. dollar that we spend. And in Mississippi, you get three yep. dollars. So I find that's pretty interesting. On top of the fact that the poverty line is an index for local cost of living or, or mm -hmm. for local wage levels. And so it's a lot easier in a sense to qualify in some of these red states, okay, which are already getting these big matching grants. Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of fascinating that the political equilibrium that we've seen has been the blue states that are kind of more liberal, mm -hmm. right, getting lower matching grants, having lower eligibility rates with these red states that don't care so much. Okay, but they support the matching system because they're coming away with huge amounts of money, right? And so, uh, at least that, that's, my, that's my guess. And so what I see in the future, all right, is that we have to deal with some way of reforming the system because of the sort of the trajectory 
of healthcare costs over the next 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. And in Canada, they actually decide to apportion the grants uh, on a per capita basis. Mm -hmm. So they don't have, they have a, basically a block grant per person, okay, mm -hmm. regardless of where they live. Mm -hmm. I think that's a much better system in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, although it would be even nicer to say, hey, Florida has a lot of old people, so maybe the fact that they have more people that are going to mm -hmm. need long-term health care, mm -hmm. um, maybe they should get more money. So do you think there's any, I want to raise, raise this into a question, okay, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, we have, there's, there is a lot of concern about wasteful spending in healthcare relative to other you know, domains of life, food, clothing, et cetera, that we not, we're not so generous with. We probably need to do something about containing long, uh, costs in the long term. Right. And what I'm curious is, um, how do you see the, the, the politics of this changing as sort of you know, the Ryans and the Romneys of the world are trying to find solutions and as states like Georgia and Texas, their incomes are rising, it seems like. So it may be that the red states are going to start um, becoming less advantaged with these programs. I'm yeah. not sure if that's going to happen. But, you know, because we've seen, you know, that these, these used to be economic backwaters that got big match right. rates. Right. And now I, I'm not sure that's going to happen anymore. And so what I'm curious is, what, what do you think that, A, Medicaid has become a wasteful system because of the matching system, especially in some of these states? And B, do you think that there's a way, uh, a way forward in terms of reforming it to sort of deal with the long-term prospects for the next 30 or 40 years? Oh, I'll, I'll start. Um, let me go to one, and I may not have heard you right on your empirical assertion, and then I'll try to deal with the waste thing and hold my feet to the fire if I forget. Uh, if, I, if I forget the question. But you're right on the, on the federal match and, and places like Mississippi and so forth in the, in the Deep South and, and other places have much more fiscal incentive to do Medicaid. But of course the record is that they do not do it. That the sources, you know, they, they look a gift horse in the mouth and it's a testimony to political culture and, 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 and political ideology. So the formula if one defines a successful formula as convincing, uh, you know, the sort of poorest states to, to get benefits up where richer states have them, it's been a miserable failure. I, I, in the book, uh, I uh, trace every state increased their expenditures and enrollees per poor person. And I ask, well, is there a convergence? You know, are we getting more alike? But no. Uh, you know, the coefficient of variation is as high as ever on, on that. Uh, that kind of front. So um, uh, let me go to the uh, waste question. Um, and obviously, there are all sorts of uh, issues we face in trying to contain costs in this country and, and, and so on and so forth. And is there waste in Medicaid? There, you know, uh, they, they have, um, there, there's some calculation of fraud in, in among government programs, and I think Medicaid probably is up there at the top. But I would argue if you look at Medicaid, Plenty of warts in this program, but it is a bare bones program. What Medicaid pays per, and they have different kinds of enrollees. They're taking care of dis, people with disabilities, uh, as well as in long term care issues are expensive. I would argue that it is, uh, it is really a bare bones program. Costs per beneficiary are less than Medicare, God knows, private insurance, um, and they don't pay, you know, provider network. Adequacy is a real issue because they don't pay a lot of providers. They pay worse than the other programs. So when I hear the sort of Ryan-esque, oh, we can take 100, 800 billion over 10 years and uh, uh, everything, you know, we're going to figure out a way to make Medicaid more efficient. I just don't know. I, it's a really bare bones program. Is there waste? I'm sure there's some waste. But I, uh, I think if you try and cut it, you really are, there's going to be a price to pay in access or, or health outcome. I, you know, that's just a, a take on it. It's I'd also say the book is very good, about, you know, by the book, it's very good about how Medicaid's actually not the terrible program that we've been repeatedly told it is. Again, I don't think any of you, I don't recommend it to you, but it's not the hell of bad care and endless waits that is often portrayed to be. I would just say, being comparative again, the U.S. has a small distinction in comparative federalism as being the only country that doesn't have any kind of flat-out redistribution for no particular purpose 
from right. subnational government to subnational government, right? right? We have no equivalent of just slicing off a big chunk of revenue from Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg in order to keep Berlin stylish. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time that's because we pass our programs as being about redistribution to people, right? This is the ecological fallacy of red and blue states is that programs will often redistribute successfully to poor people in red states who are either voting Democratic or are not voting because they're various red state issues. Um, and that's why the federal government has transformed the South. You know, look at the South before the New Deal, and you can see very clearly the long-term, you could argue, Democratic Party incentive, or liberal Democratic Party incentive, to spend a lot of money creating a welfare state in the South over the objections of the people who run most of the South. It's also never a technical discussion. You don't hire economists to design a Wixellian compliant system that will deliver the correct incentives. That's the fantasy of the IMF. You can only do that if you're the IMF lording it over poor countries. In rich countries, you hire the economists for the specific, pur specific purpose of telling you how your side will win and lose in a particular negotiation. I'm Adriana McIntyre. I'm a dual degree student with Ford in the School of Public Policy. Um, I had a question about the durability of Medicaid, and I was wondering what you think the implications are of the demographic shift with baby boomers reaching 65 in record numbers mm -hmm. uh, and ostensibly feeding a growing dual eligible population. What does that mean for the program in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think if they're aware, if they stay aware of what Medicaid can do for them, uh, it, it'll be a further force bolstering uh, Medicaid durability. Uh, these numbers aren't precise, but something like 65% um, uh, of, of middle-class people enter nursing homes paying for themselves, and within a year they wind up on, on Medicaid. Medicaid has become a major uh, uh, long-term, I mean, it is the long-term care uh, uh, program for people who essentially never been on welfare are not one of these, uh, what's the phrase, uh, dependents or the takers, uh, who nonetheless at the end of life run out of luck and somebody's got to take care of them. So I would think that that's a force, and, and the duels uh, as well, a, a force for enhanced Medicaid durability. Med middle class people needing the program, on the other hand, uh, uh, getting people to recognize what Medicaid is, uh, as in how Medicare doesn't really give you a long-term care benefit, isn't easy. Although I must say, in terms of Kaiser polling, it is quite amazing the number of people, I think it's 50, 60 percent, who have either been on Medicaid or know someone who's been on Medicaid. And I know uh, in the context of uh, middle-class parents with intellectually disabled or developmentally disabled children, Great numbers of them know a whole lot about Medicaid, and they are as ferocious a defenders of the program as I think you'd find anywhere. I, if I understood the question correctly, I think um, uh, in terms of this sort of polarization that's going on, and there's a literature which I haven't read that talks about not only are we ideologically getting that way, but that people are literally voting geographically with their feet. That, you know, uh, yeah, you know that conservative people live more in Texas, and if you're liberal, you, uh, you know, you live more in New Jersey. I have never analyzed that carefully. But I, I do believe that unlike the first Medicaid program, where it took about five years to get, this is 65 that was passed, five years for every state except Arizona to sign on, uh, that this time could be different, that there may be 
ideological holdouts in places like Texas or the, the Deep South, uh, which are, are really unified Republican governments now, uh, contrary to what it was for most of our history. The Republicans control both houses of the legislature and, and run the government. So it'll be interesting to me whether you know, they ever do come on board and whether this variance that I think you're talking about as a result gets wider and wider. You talk in your book about the growth in expenditures over time as a sign of Medicaid's durability. And I wonder if you also think of that as a threat to its durability, given that as it takes up a larger and larger percentage of state budgets, it becomes a target for cuts. There is a downside as well as an upside. Peter Orsog, who's, you know, the work for uh, 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 President Obama has been very much in the forefront of those who argue that Medicaid is uh, hurting higher education and uh, other, other, other functions. And, uh, and especially with uh, uh, the cost growth uh, that you mentioned, the sort of relentless increases of, of costs, even to what I would argue is a relatively bare bones, not so wasteful program, uh, there are really hard choices out there in terms of how much you can, and states I'm thinking of in particular, put into Medicaid. And uh, um, I have no, I don't know, other than that the higher education community is a whole lot weaker politically than the Medicaid community, I probably, and that's not a right or wrong kind of answer, but it's just, you know, it is a downside. You're right, people do talk about cutting it, but, but again, I'm struck with the Ryan program Alice Rivlin, uh, economist in Washington and, and policy player, said that no governor in his or her right mind would possibly support the Ryan plan if it ever became possible. Now it's been all sort of talk and, and nobody was going to pass it. Now what's, what we mean by right mind in these times is up for grabs, but, uh, but it would have devastating impacts on the fiscal pressures that states would face if, if anything like that came close. Thank you. Hi, Jason Buxbaum. I'm a student in health management and policy. Uh, my question for the panelists um, is around some of these odd incentives that you get for duels, uh, where a state might invest in better long-term care uh, pay more out of its own pocket, even though it's getting the match, the savings accrue to Medicare. And yeah. I know there, there's been more attention to this issue in recent years and the, the duels demos and a special office created in the ACA, but it still seems like a fundamental tension. And I can't think of any other um, state-federal partnership program that has this kind of terrible incentive built in. Um, I was just hoping to hear your thoughts. Uh, there's got to be some other program that has a terrible <laughs> I don't know what it is, though. You, you've got me there. But I, I just agree with you. Uh, if, 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 if we get a system where we don't put people in hospitals so much, we keep them in the, you know, reduce hospital readmissions for the elderly, say, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, states are absorbing the costs and Medicare is getting off scot-free, or not scot-free, but with a good less, less expenditure, there ought to be a, where, a, a way of, of sh sharing the savings, and of course they're working on it. Uh, and, and I don't, I, I, there's obviously been no breakthrough. Hope springs eternal, but you're right uh, on, the, on the basic uh, uh, dysfunction in the incentive structure. David. Yeah, David Jones, School of Public Health doctoral student. Um, I was at a speech, or at an event recently where I saw a Republican congressman give a speech and he said that one of the reasons that the implementation of the ACA is failing so miserably is because states weren't involved in uh, the drafting of the legislation. So strong <laughs> assertion. Um, I I'd be curious to hear you talk a little bit more about the role of states in the legislative process. You talked about the Governor's Association. And right. from that point moving forward, what, if anything, the Obama administration or Congress could have done that would have led to different outcomes? I, you know, I, I hear the argument from time to time that if only there would have been greater reaching across the aisle and we would have come up with something. 
But I find, and, and I'll get to your more specific point in a minute, but I just, having read countless books on the passage, some books on the passage of, the, uh, of Obamacare, and then focused in particular on Medicaid, I, I, I just don't think this, if only they would have tried to reach out to us, I just don't think it's, right, it's true. Um, in the case of the states, um, the governors, uh, for understandable reasons, were very, very concerned about whatever the match rate would be. And there were some certifiably crazy proposals out of the U.S. Senate, some by Democrats, which uh, argued that uh, they didn't want to give this very enhanced 100% early, 90% match. And they even talked about, well, states could borrow money to cover their, you know, Share of them, I really terrible ideas, and the governors fought back on on that front, very fearful of an unfunded mandate, and were were quite vigorous. And and people on the Hill uh, begin to read it early on. The National Governors Association uh, tried to get a you know a, a group of uh, of governors together to offer sensible input, but but by I think um, uh, the middle of um, 2009, this uh, uh, Obamacare, or the health reform, had taken off into the realm of ideology, symbolism. Uh, we can, if we can break Obama's back on this one, he'll be a one-term president. I just think it got elevated by July, um, you know, to. Uh, uh, Never, never landed. So, and the, the Democratic governors, by and large, said, oh yes, we'll endorse, we're for Obama, and we'll endorse this, and the Republican governors, unif I think, uniformly opposed it. By that point, it had just become caught up in a sort of, I'm for it, you're against it. And I think the governors had less, other than around the match rate, less influence than, than they otherwise would have. Um, so I'm, my name is Claire Hutchinson. I'm a first year at the Ford School. Kind of building off of, I believe your name's David's comment question. Do you think that governors and states would have had a very different approach to the implementation of the ACA had this happened in better economic times? I think a lot of states they come back and say, you know, we're really worried about the fiscal implications. But had this been legislation of the late '90s, would they have looked at it differently? Well. And you jump into. I think um, um, I think economic better economic times would have helped, but I really think this ideological shift or, or polarization we've seen over the last thirty years, and political scientists have really sort of studied this fairly carefully. You know, uh, whether Rick Perry and the people in Texas would have liked this. I mean, times there weren't as bad as a lot of places. It helped, but I, I think the political ideology really does matter. Hi, um, my name is Justin Lanner, I'm a grad student in the Econ Department. Um, so one thing that I've noticed with um, sort of medical expenses in the United States, especially in the last uh, several decades, is that they're being driven more and more by chronic long-term illnesses like type 2 diabetes, um, heart disease, and you know, various forms of cancer. Um, and many of these diseases are also highly correlated with poverty. Um, I mean, a lot of people uh, end up with type 2 diabetes because they can only afford mm -hmm. to eat crappy food and lead a crappy lifestyle, basically. Um, and I'm wondering if there's been any serious um, discussion at a policy level of using um, consumption taxation to not only raise money uh, to pay for these diseases, but also to discourage those behaviors as a form of uh, containing the cost. Um, I know that that's something that academics talk about. Right. And I'll just briefly comment on Medicaid. And it's, uh, uh, Scott. There, there is an effort within some Medicaid, some states, to make Medicaid uh, patients more individually responsible about their health. And there's sort of a notion that if they're having a health problem, a lot of it is due to bad habits. But the level of, um, of uh, uh, sort of 
penalty or incentive structure they set up, it's not clear to me whether you know, how much of an impact it's, it's had. Beyond that, I don't know you, if, if you had anything about it. I, I, and I, I take your point, but I haven't heard anything very major, especially around a consumption tax in, in that respect, at least in the Medicaid realm. I think the last place I would look for a comprehensive, coherent tax reform would be Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard enough to do it on a state level if you were in Michigan over the last couple of years. So I think you'd look for individual governments trying it out. New York State and New York City seem to be particularly fond of such experiments. And potentially it would diffuse. Uh, I don't think the diffusion literature tells us whether that's true or not. I'd also say that, that that's part of a, a broader subset of things that everyone in the world is dealing with, which is that we have a lot of welfare state and health programs that were set up essentially on the premise that you needed some, some kind of cover for when you were off work then you needed some kind of cover for the medical bills. And then they would usually add something for doctor bills. That's the rough progress of health insurance development in the US. And that's the rough progress of its development in a lot of places. The problem is this, is not, this does not produce a system in any country that's particularly well suited to complex comorbidities, chronic problems, or anything to do with the long-term care wave that's coming at us. The Class Act, uh, which has now been cut, was an interest, intellectually interesting effort to try it. The United Kingdom has commissioned a number of reports, which they've run into the sand as soon as they saw the budgetary estimates. And the result is that I think you have a lot of ferment, and as far as I can tell, no really good ideas on what you do about systems that are very, very good at paying you to go to hospital, reasonably good at paying you to go for episodes of care with the doctor, largely poor, despite all the PR, at getting you to do, you know, live a healthier lifestyle, and absolutely out of ideas on questions of long-term care. And that includes going back to what do you do with dual eligibles. Um, there's a range of other ideas worldwide, which range from even more expensive and silly than dual eligibles through to throw grandma from the train. Well, I would like to ask uh, about what happens when governors and legislatures are on a different track. In Michigan, we have Republican governor, Republican legislature, but they don't agree about what to do with Medicaid. Do either of you have any uh, suggestions of what's likely to be the next step and what might be done? Uh, I don't, certainly don't know the case in Michigan. Uh, Jan Brewer in Arizona has a similar, uh, a similar problem. Um, you know, that, it'll be very interesting. There's a book out recently uh, on whether governors get their way with legislatures. <laughs> and one part of it deals with sort of the non-budget items. And they have, a, you know, that's, there's variance, of course, in, in particular circumstances. But they have a hard time winning on a lot of their sort of substantive proposals. And this is in the aggregate. It's, I'm not talking about Medicaid in particular. When it comes to budget items, however, in budget proposals, uh, governor, the track record of governors is pretty impressive dealing with legislatures. And I, I, I don't know where, you know, it's obviously got big, it's got budget implications, it's obviously a substantive proposal. I don't know how strong the Tea Party is in the, among the, you know, sort of the Republicans in Michigan. But it's, you're right, it uh, came out where you have this separation of powers fragment system, so what governors want may not carry the day. In 30 seconds. There's also, executives have to have some kind of outcome legitimacy. They can do something and claim credit for it. Mm -hmm. You can say what Rick Snyder did, and then do you like it or not? Legislators, be they the House of Representatives or be they the Michigan Assembly, the main thing they do is take positions, and they're often fiercely policed by all sorts of factions within the party for the positions that they take. So structurally, it's much easier to look like a sensible person and a leader as a governor than as a member of the House of Representatives, where you pretty much condemn to look like a blowhard much of the time. The other point is, who would be a member of the Michigan State Legislature or the California State Legislature? You're good enough to run an enterprise of that scale and complexity. You're personable enough to get elected. And what, at age 40, you're going to abandon your obviously successful career for an eight-year term-limited career break? So you can be surrounded by a rabble of ideologues in their 20s quite frequently? I mean, who would be a legislature in these states? Mark. 
Yeah, I want to go back to uh, Affordable Care Act and the expansion of Medicaid and the, uh, certainly based on Massachusetts' experience, the requirement for vastly increased numbers of primary care physicians um, because of the expansion and uh, what the potential is there for addressing some of these um, behavioral issues from, in, in, in effect, going to a public health model rather than the illness model to get more families started on the right foot through from birth, but everybody's covered at birth now mm -hmm. just yeah. because of reimbursement requirements. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of, of having that coverage um, more comprehensively and perhaps messages more comprehensively developed from a public health perspective. With the, that model. I think it's, a, it, it's an absolutely great idea, um, and, uh, and I'm beginning to follow, follow this, and, and the degree to which states attempt to encourage that kind of public health model, I think will be very, it's, a, it's tricky, it's, it's not gonna be easy, given the sort of interests that are running around that system. Uh, the other point I would make, and I think this was part of your remark, is that I am hopeful uh, that uh, in the, you know, as the demand for sort of primary care providers increase, increases, that nurse, at least nurse practitioners, will gain uh, more ability to deal with certain, you know, basic sort of health issues, which could also, if done right, might facilitate the sort of public health for, uh, kind of perspective. And, um, uh, we'll see. There's certainly movement, I think some movement in that direction, but I haven't tracked it at all empirically. But it's, you're right, it'll be a real pressure point. There's also a case for more efficiency and better use of people because we're in a worldwide healthcare workforce shortage. And given that the United States is a country with essentially no concept of cost containment, we've been hoovering up medical professionals from the entire planet. Mm. Well, particularly India. At some point, India is actually going to have enough jobs for all those excess doctors. And if China doesn't start exporting doctors, we're in the soup. The whole world's getting older together. Much of the world is getting richer. And the United States is structurally dependent on essentially pillaging India. And I don't think that's a long-term viable strategy. And so we come to the end of a conversation about <laughs> on pillaging India. <laughs> that on the I'm one against hand, it. It's remarkably durable, has been noted. But the fault lines are really extraordinary, whether that is within a state between state and nation, and even, and we didn't have time for conversation, what happens when a second term, term limited president does not like the reaction of some governors and the very possibility, which I hadn't thought of before, of waivers being withdrawn or made more difficult when normally the presumption of waivers is they are expanding exponentially. Does that become even still a, a kind of, a, a, of an intergovernmental power play and tool? I guess we stay tuned as we move into another decade of Medicaid. With that, please join me in thanking our panelists.